Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. So uh, I'm doing a Q&A this week, which will likely turn into two parts because one, I talk too much and my answers are never short, uh, and two, you guys ask a lot of questions. That being said, I will likely not get to all of the questions that are asked between my YouTube community tab post and uh, Instagram because there's a lot. I haven't looked at any of them yet, but I have seen the notifications pouring in. So we're just going to get started and we're just going to bounce back and forth and see where the winds take us. That was dramatic. Okay, so let's see. I'm opening the community tab here. So let's see. Oh God, first question. What are your top favorite books that you think everyone should read? Well, that's painful. <sighs> let's see. Top favorite books. Okay. The Scorpio Races by Maggie Stiefvater. I feel like that's a universally loved book by all ages and all genre readers. It kind of covers all of the bases. It's very unique. Um, I will always and forever recommend the Akatar series to anybody who is interested in getting into fantasy romance, um, specifically book two. Does that count as one book? The series has to be read as a whole. So... So that book, um, if you are a high fantasy reader or an adult fantasy reader, The Poppy War, it's rough, it's a doozy, check trigger warnings for that book, but it is a masterpiece and I love that book and always will. Um, what else can I recommend? Um, the Grip series by Kennedy Ryan, if you are into contemporary romance, because that also is a hard-hitting, emotional, good book about conversations about race, but also it is one of the steamiest romances ever. It is so good. Um, should I touch a different genre? Sci-fi. What do I recommend? The Wayfarer series by Becky Chambers. Long Way to a Small Angry Planet. That's a good one. If you like the show Firefly, you'll like that book. It's good, like, found family, but also space fur and cowboy vibes. It's good times. There we go. Those are going to be my five recommendations. Some of them are series. I apologize. I don't take those questions too literally because that would be painful. <sighs> Let's see. Do you ever regret not becoming a veterinarian and would you consider doing it now? No, I don't. I truly, back when I was kind of making my like college decisions and everything, and also now as a 31 year old, um, I still don't think that I have it in me to be a veterinarian. Um, I would easily be a vet tech, which is essentially what I'm doing now. Um, but I also do veterinarian work at my job. I have a very like specific job just because I'm head of the medical staff at an animal rescue and I primarily deal with cats. There are dogs and stuff there too, but they are not necessarily always under my care. Um, so I do all of like the medical ordering. I do all of the diagnosing and prescribing under the assistance of vets that we have on staff, but I am the one there pretty much every day. And I'm the one who has basically seen all of the issues that have come up over the years. Um, so I do a lot of veterinarian work, but here's the thing. I'm not dealing with the public and that is my main um, reason why I don't think I have it in me to be a vet. Because I am very capable of doing the medical side of things. The diagnosing, the prescribing, the treating. I give shots, I give oral meds, um, I can diagnose when an animal needs to be put down. Um, things like that that are tough, but I don't have the pet's owner in front of me. And I think that makes a huge difference. As somebody who worked in customer service for a long time also when I was high school, college age, and beyond. Um, I have paid my dues with uh, working with the public, and I don't have it in me to do it anymore. Um, but I primarily don't think that I could be that person to euthanize a pet in front of the pet's owner. I emotionally am not capable of doing that. Like, I would be a sobbing mess on the floor along with the owner, which is not exactly professional. Um, so I do handle all of those same things at my job, but it's a very different environment um, and dealing with people in the veterinary world is why veterinarians have the highest like suicide risk out of any career in the world. Um, it's a tough field and I, I know that I don't emotionally have it in me to deal with the people side of veterinary care, if that makes sense. So I ideally am doing my dream job <laughs> without that part of it. So I essentially found my dream job and I essentially get to do all of the cool doctoring stuff under the assistance of other veterinarians who are licensed and trained. So it's not like I'm just going willy nilly and doing everything. So I'm getting the really cool experience, the hands on experience of treating everything without the pressure of the people part. So that was long winded, but no, I don't regret it. 
And would you consider doing it now? I kind of am. So there you go. Okay, let's see. <sighs> what is the longest you have ever been able to adhere to a self-imposed book buying ban? I didn't last a week, lol. Um, I don't really do timeline bans. I also haven't really ever done a very strict book buying ban. This is me speaking from a position of privilege, so know that going in. I get sent a lot of books. Um, and it gets to the point where, this is again, a person of privilege saying this, it gets very overwhelming after a while to the point where like it kind of takes the fun out of buying books. So I stepped back from working with publishers almost 100% at this point for that specific reason. So I occasionally still get things sent from you guys or from book box companies or things like that, but I have more books than I could possibly get through in a lifetime. So I every now and then I'll reach a phase where I'm just like, I think I'm good for a while. And I'll just kind of read what I have. And then one release will come out and I'll be like, I'm going to pre-order that. And that's kind of my flow. I don't really do strict book buying bans just because I feel like I have fairly good self-control at this point in my reading life. Um, so I don't have an answer for that question. Okay. May I send scritches to your adorable animals and maybe a nose boot for those who don't mind it? Of course you can. I will insert some nose booping footage for you. Oh, sneak peek. Alrighty, there we go. Was that good? Did you did you get an animal fix? Okay, let's see. Um, how long do you keep an unread book on your shelf before you unhaul it? Mm, I don't know. Oh, I don't know if I have a timeline with that. Um, I have gotten pretty vicious with unhauling over the years. I don't film them anymore. I know you guys are going to be very upset over hearing that. Um, but it's just something that makes me uncomfortable just because again, speaking from a position of privilege, a lot of books get sent to me without me knowing, like they'll be unsolicited books. And I have always had this guilt complex of having to keep those because they were sent to me from a publisher or something. Um, so I tend to keep things longer than I probably should. But over the past like two-ish years, I've gotten pretty ruthless. Like when I run out of shelf space, I'm like, it's time to go. It is time to go. And once I get going, I can keep going. So um, it depends on the genre of the book because I know there are specific genres that I will come back to periodically and I just might not be in the mood for it right now. So things kind of like high fantasy or sci-fi are genres that I will pretty much always come back to at some point in my life. So I tend to keep those longer. Um, things that I know are very popular in the moment, I will keep those basically until I basically stop seeing the hype for it or I'll see like the the trendiness of a book kind of decline and see if I actually really still want to read it for myself or if I actually just got it because of the hype of the community. Um, so there's that and also again genres. So I keep a lot of books for sentimental value um, but I've reached the point where I essentially am not reading YA almost at all anymore but here's the thing I read YA for like almost 30 years. That's an exaggeration. I wasn't reading it when I was a baby. But like I was deep into the YA genre from when I was a teenager up until I was about 30. And I have so many memories attached to those books. Like I have books that were like the very first arcs that I was ever sent or a book that changed the genre as a whole. Like I'll always keep my Twilight books. Will I ever read them again? I don't know. Probably. But like those books to me changed the genre. So whether or not they're good books, I still have sentimental moments attached to them. So it's, there's, it's circumstantial, I guess. A lot of books I'll keep for a very long time. Other books I'll basically give it like a season and then move on from them. So <laughs> variety of answers. Does that answer anything? I don't know. Is that, there's a lot of questions asking if that's sushi. That is sushi. The picture that I posted, I'll put it on the screen. That is sushi. Uh, he is a bowling ball. That little creature is so big <laughs> and he's a Manx, which looking into this, the breed itself, um, they are known for being very round cats. Like their bone structure is very big and round. Um, and I think the lack of tail also makes him look chubbier because he looks like a little teddy bear, but that sucker is large and in charge now. He's still very short, but he's very wide. <laughs> 
He's a very chubby cat. Um, let's see. Ooh, what is your favorite and least favorite diamond painting? I don't know. I have to look through them. Hold on. Okay, I'm interpreting this as completed diamond paintings. So my least favorite is this one uh, because this was my experimental phase of trying out cheap paintings that you can buy off of like Amazon or Etsy or Wish um, that are not like licensed, not uh, well produced, and this one was a bear to do. I like how it looks, it's pretty. Um, and then another one that is oddly in the same vein as that one is another witchy girl. Um, this is a Diamond Art Club one that I honestly really like now that it's finished. I don't know how to like uh, lean back far enough for you guys to see the whole thing. I like this one, but this one only had like 20 four colors in it and they were all browns and grays and um that got very dreary after like three weeks of working on that I was like if I never look at another brown drill again I'll be happy so surprisingly both of these are like witchy chicks I don't know what that says about me because I love the aesthetic of them I like how they look but the actual act of doing them not enjoyable. And then favorite one, I'm gonna spin you guys around because it's the one that's still on my wall. I'm working on a partner piece for this one, but it's this one. It's this puppy because it took me forever. I'm gonna climb on my desk. I say this every time you guys ask. It's this sucker because it took me eternity and I love it. It's the only one that I hung on my wall. I'm working on two other pieces to go here and here. I like this one though. Okay, okay, we're sitting back down now. So there you go, those are my answers. Um, let's see. Okay. Oh, I'm going to use this question to transition over to Instagram because I saw this asked a lot both on YouTube and Instagram. I get this question pretty frequently whenever I do Q&As and it's always asking advice for people who are looking to get into BookTube, advice for new people or what you would do or what I would recommend as new YouTuber advice sort of things. So my go-to answer that I tell everybody that I feel like isn't a normal thing that a lot of other YouTubers would recommend, um, but specifically for just me in general or booktube, I talk out my videos before I ever start filming them. And that helped me tremendously to figure out my thoughts and get them in order before I actually hit record. So I'm talking when you're driving in your car by yourself, when you're in the shower, when you're just like doing chores around the house, literally speak the words out loud that you wanna say in a video because I feel like everything up here sounds great up here, but when you actually go to like open your mouth hole and say the words, it's hard for some reason. That just might be a me thing, but that is something that helped me out tremendously is literally talking out my videos before I film them so that I have like a good flow or a good, I don't know, way of saying things that doesn't sound dumb. <laughs> Case in point, I'm answering this by the seat of my pants and uh, I don't think that I'm speaking very coherently. So that is a piece of advice, um, but it also will kind of let you know if it's something that you want to do. Once you start actually talking videos out and you have an idea of the type of videos that you want to make, it'll give you an idea of whether you think you actually want to do it. Um, so that is a very specific piece of advice. And then the other general piece of advice that all YouTubers or all people who are on social media in general will recommend is just do it. Pull a Nike and just do it. You just kind of have to start because you won't figure out if it's something you like if you're not actually doing it. Um, in the beginning, before you have a lot of people following, it's a good time to make mistakes. Like you don't have a big audience that you'll be embarrassed that saw you make a dumb video. Um, just start doing it because you kind of won't know if you like it until you do it. And also speaking as somebody who's been in this field for a long time, um, everybody wishes that they had started sooner because you would be further than you are if you had started a year earlier, if that makes sense. So to me, just start it because the earlier the better that you get in on a specific niche part of the internet, you might be the first person talking about things. Probably not because the internet's been around for a while and everything has been talked about, but <laughs> the earlier you get in, the better you'll feel having started earlier, if that makes sense. There we go. Okay, that covers like a broad range of all the questions that people are asking for just new booktuber advice is just start it, talk out your videos, and that's it. Okay. Okay, let's see. Ooh, first question is a good one. How do you prioritize reading? I can't keep off of my phone. That is a huge issue for everybody. Anybody who says that they are not addicted to their phones is lying to you 
it's the age that we live in. Um, so my biggest piece of advice for this is you just have to prioritize it. If it's something you want to do, you have to do it. Um, and the ways that I have figured out that work for me is I use apps that lock me out of my phone for a specific amount of time. Um, so I use the app called Forest and it's brief synopsis of it. You grow a little plant, like a little tree or a little bush, um, depending on how long you set the timer for. And basically if you get on your phone and close out of that app to do something on your phone while you have that timer going, it kills your tree. The guilt alone of killing a little fake cartoon tree is enough to work for me. It might not be for other people, but that works for me. It's a good system. Um, so I will do that in the morning when I first wake up because I don't have to be on my phone the second that I open my eyes. So for the first half an hour that I'm awake, I will set a little tree to grow so that I can like get up and I do my morning routine and I read. Um, and same thing late at night. Once it's late at night and you're done for your day and you don't have to be answering emails or you don't have to be replying to your friends late at night, set a little tree to grow so that you can read. So that has worked for me with getting back into physically reading books. But if you're in deep, like most of us are, um, listening to an audiobook while you play Candy Crush on your phone is also a recommendation because you're still getting the mental stimulation that your brain is craving with the phone addiction, um, but you're technically reading because you're listening to an audiobook while you're doing other stuff. So that's also a tip. Is that healthy? No, probably not, but it works for me. Um, what is a hobby that you want to try? This is interesting because I have been getting back into crafting and I have basically been looking through the craft world to find things that I've never tried before because I am perpetually chasing the high of elementary school art class where you are learning a new skill starting from scratch. Um, and I feel like as adults, it's very hard for us to find things that we have never tried when it comes to like tactile things. Um, so I am currently pr in the process of learning paper quilling. If you guys know what it is, I don't know how to describe it. It's basically like little strips of paper that you like um, wind up around something and you make really tight spirals and you make art with little spirals of paper. Um, so I'm learning that and it's fun because it's something that like has my brain active again because I'm learning it from scratch. I've never done it before. I've never seen anybody do it before. So I'm just kind of watching YouTube videos um, to get ideas of how to use the different little coils of paper. Um, and it's super fun. So I'm learning that. I also would like to try and get into calligraphy. That's something that I've always wanted to try and do, but I've never actually done it. So that is another craft that I'm thinking about getting into. Um, and I would like to say cross stitching, but I don't think I'm going to because diamond painting is very similar to cross stitching. It's honestly almost the exact same hobby where like images are rendered in the same programs. It's the same exact concept, but instead of sewing an X, you stick a diamond to that exact spot. So it's a very similar hobby that can get just as intense and expensive as diamond painting. So I think I'm going to choose to avoid that, but I would like to get into it. It's fine. I'm fine. Oh, Crystal, what animal do you wish you could have? Is this realistic animal or exotic animal? Because that can vary. Realistic animal? I don't know how realistic this would be. I would love to get a riding horse again. I obviously have Hercules, but I obviously can't ride Hercules. And it's been years since I've really ridden. Um, so one day in the future, whenever me and my husband move to a bigger farm, I would love to get a full-size horse. I'm, I'm saying this because I have a mini horse, for those of you who are new here. I have a miniature horse um, and some goats. So I don't have anything that I can ride, and I have been a rider forever, so ideally I would love to get a rideable horse. Um, what's a more pet-like answer? I want a raccoon or a skunk really bad as, as like a pet, like a domesticated one. Those are my dream animals. Uh, yeah, we'll go with that. We'll go with that. Exotic animal? A giraffe? Do you know how freaking cool it would be to have a giraffe or a panda in your backyard? Those are my unrealistic answers. Do you think you would ever go back to fantasy or is romance your genre now? I'm still reading fantasy. I'm actually reading Daughter of the Moon Goddess right now. So I do read fantasy and I'm reading fantasy romance and romance. So I actually do read a lot outside of the romance genre. And according to my statistics as of right now, I'm reading more nonfiction than fiction, which is interesting. So I technically read outside of romance. Romance is kind of my default genre right now where like if I don't know what to read, I will default back to romance. But there's there's fantasy romance, which can count as fantasy. Um, but I also I also read a lot of high fantasy just in general. So 
I, I do indeed. Uh, let's see. If you could become any animal, what would it be? I would become one of my own cats because I would love to benefit from all of the things that I do for them. You know, whenever, like, for all of you pet owners, whenever you, like, feed them dinner and then they lay down and take a nap and you have to get yourself dressed and go to work and you're like, man, I'm envious that you get to just, like, sleep on the couch all day, I would love to be one of my own pets. Oh, that sounds very conceited. I would love to just be a pet in general. Can I be someone's golden retriever? Because, like, they're always happy and they generally have really good lives and their only meaning in life is to bring joy to humans and be happy and chew on sticks and sleep and eat. I would love that. That'd be great. I loved your Spiritfarer rec. Do you have any more cozy game recs? Uh, Yonder is a really fun one. Yonder is kind of, I think it's like an indie game. It feels very similar to Breath of the Wild where you kind of have like an open world to explore and you can kind of do whatever you want at your own pace. Um, and there are no enemies or combat in it, so there's very low stakes. That's kind of what I look for in cozy games is low stakes. I don't want time limits. I don't want to have to fight things if I don't want to. I just want to casually make friends with animals and grow crops, and that's it. <laughs> so Yonder is good. Um, there's a new game that I have been watching religiously until it's in beta right now, but it's called Palea and it's the first MMO cozy game. It's a completely open world kind of RPG type of fantasy game, but it you can opt to not have combat in it. That's a setting that you can toggle off so there can be no combat whatsoever, but it essentially gives you all of the cozy game feels plus more. So you can choose to just stay in your little farm and grow your crops and catch all of the fish and befriend all of the animals and form relationships with villagers that are close to you, or you can go on adventures and complete tasks and quests. So that is my ideal game. It's called Palea and it's not out yet. There is no release date yet as of right now, but it's in beta testing. And I feel like that is going to be my ideal game because it's also online. So you can kind of play with your friends and you can just go on adventures together and it sounds great. And if you are feeling spicy, you can add combat in to add stakes to your game. That is a game that I'm desperate for. I hope it comes out relatively soon. So that's a whole thing. Um, This is getting very long. Should I split this into two parts? I'm gonna split it into two parts. So I'll pop back in uh, with another part in like two days. You guys will see it back to back. So I'll, I just wanna split this into a two-parter instead of having like a 45 minute long video that I have to edit. We'll just do two. 20 something minute videos. Okay, so I will see you guys in a part two momentarily. Momentarily for me, two days for you. Does that sound good? Sounds good to me. Okay, I will see you then.